Uh, dear colleagues, we are going to continue with our second session today. And the first presenter is Alexandra Kiriak, who comes from the University of St. Andrews, United Kingdom. Uh, she will be presenting the paper named The Magical and the Mechanical Experiments for a Future Yiddish Theatre in Bucharest. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope, feel like I'm a bit of a newcomer here because I have just joined the Reclaimed Avant-Garde project, so I'm looking forward to being part of that. Um, but actually, it's nice to be back at Burbeck because this is where I actually started my studies a very long time ago. So it's the first time I've been back since. Um, okay. So I'm going to be speaking about Yiddish theatre in Bucharest. Jakob Sternberg, a poet and writer born in Bessarabia, was one of the most innovative theatre directors in Romania during his time in the country between 1913 and 1940. Sternberg combined his knowledge of the traditions of Yiddish theatre with an interest in popular culture and a thorough understanding of contemporary theatrical developments. In 1930, he attempted to create a permanent association for the development of Yiddish theatre in Romania, which had a long tradition in the country already. He called his organization the Bucharest Yiddish Theatre Studio, or BITS, B-I-T-S. Although in the end BITS lasted less than a year, two of Sternberg's performances created a great echo in the contemporary press and the wider artistic community. And over the past couple of years, I've been looking for material related to these performances. Um, and so now I have quite a bit of visual and textual material, um, which will allow me to show you kind of what these performances look like. <coughs> Um, Bits debuted in late January 1930 with a premiere of A Night in the Old Marketplace. According to theatre scholar Deborah Kaplan, this 1907 play by I. L. Peretz had only been produced by two companies before this date. In 1925 by the Moscow, Moscow Yiddish Art Theatre and in 1928 by the Vilna Troupe in Warsaw. The Bucharest production, so far unknown in international scholarship, is thus a significant moment in theatrical history, joining in the small number of attempts to bring Peretz's drama to the stage. As um, Deborah Kaplan explains, a night in the old marketplace was difficult to produce and so rarely was. Even with double or triple casting, dozens of actors would still be required. Peretz also called for an enormous and exceedingly complex set that included eight shape-shifting buildings, stable enough for actors to climb upon, a hidden catapult, giant movable tombstones, a floating cemetery that emerges in midair, and a remote controlled mechanical rooster. And mm. <laughs> that's the end of the quote. So, um, interviewed in a Bucharest newspaper for the launch of Bits, Sternberg also listed the two previous productions, uh, the Moscow and the Warsaw ones, and positioned his own interpretation as a new type of staging. According to him, a knight was such a rare presence on stage because it did not suit the trend for theatrical realism. Sternberg's production was extensively photographed. And so I have been able to gather a number of images during my research. And what is evident from all the existing images is a desire to emphasize the radical aesthetics of the production beyond the stationary design elements, especially through the dynamism of the actor's movements and the use of stage lighting techniques. The set itself was simple, allowing these human and technical elements to establish their domination over the stage. The images reveal a base structure that remained on stage throughout the production. It was the titular old marketplace, etched on both sides by hollow structures stacked in a regular fashion to suggest the buildings surrounding it. Excuse, excuse me. Could you please speak up a little bit? Sure. In the background, a church and a synagogue <laughs> are sketched out naively as though on a blackboard. The entire structure appears haphazard and lopsided. The edges curve or slide, the balcony slats are bent, the sketched buildings lean forward as though wishing to meet in the middle. This clearly is part of the illusion as the set is vigorously put through its paces in the photographs with actors scaling its various structures. The conception of the staging was influenced in part by the Vilna Troupe's Warsaw production of the play, directed by David Herrmann. He had adapted it, making it suitable for a smaller cast. <coughs> And I think you can see from this uh, photograph of the 1928 production um, that the set is built from a similar structure to the Bucharest one, with curved openings and ramps, steps, and even a balcony that are similarly positioned. Furthermore, the church and the synagogue are also two-dimensional presences in the background, lopsidedly positioned, and the dynamic contortions of the actors fill the stage. 
Sternberg had already worked with the Vilna Troop during their time in Romania in the mid-1920s, and some of the actors from the Warsaw performances were directly involved in his own staging in Bucharest. Um, David Licht, for example, took, place, uh, took part in both productions, and this uh, portrait photo of him in character was taken at the Bucharest studio, um, showing his costume, his face painting, and his uh, prosthetic nose. And here you can see him um, on this side of the stage. Here he is in Bucharest. Um, now, I still haven't quite figured out where he is in this photograph. <laughs> um, but um, I think it's um, always important to bear in mind the remarkable mobility of the theatrical avant garde during this period and the fact that they collaborated between themselves quite, quite a bit. And mobility and encounters, although of a different kind, are also <laughs> present in a night in the old marketplace. The play is an ensemble piece that follows a string of nocturnal activities in an atemporal town square, where the worlds of the living and the dead collide. The prologue reveals that we are watching a play within a play, as several theatre staff are at work on an imminent production. Soon, however, the fictional world takes over the ostensibly real one, and the audience plunge into the action together with the make-believe theatre director and stage manager. A further playfully surreal dimension is revealed by this photograph in which Sternberg, the genuine theatre director, stands on stage next to the drama that unfolds. He's over here wearing a suit. This may have been a promotional photograph or he may be on stage playing Peretz's fictional theatre director. However, no complete car sheet has yet come to light to confirm such a conjecture. He is joined on stage by three characters, two of whom appear recurrently in the existing images. They are two of the dramatis personae that frame and reflect on the action, perhaps the jester, the wanderer, or the narrator. In some images, such as this one, they also provide a physical frame standing on opposite sides of the stage. The simple modular structure of the set served as a background for the intricate movement patterns created by the actors. Photographs um, such as this one show the ensemble cast in carefully constructed formations. In particular, the emergence of the dead from their graves and their subsequently frenzied dance must have been amongst the most dramatic scenes that the audience encountered. In one image, hands rise up from behind the parapet, framed by two beams of light engaging in a gestural ballet whose shadows fall ghostly upon the backdrop. Fine to have yes. it off to recognize the photograph is. That's back to anything. <laughs> oh, no, it's not. Thank you. The dance itself shows bodies merging and contorting, leaning and arching in gravity defying fashion. These dance scenes have the linear progression of a futurist painting in which the eye is drawn across the canvas at breakneck speed with movements blurring and succeeding each other. According to contemporary reviews, the ingenious use of movement was one of the main innovations of the production. In the avant-garde periodical Adam, which dedicated a whole issue to the production, one reviewer wrote, Sternberg's great magic resides in his understanding of the fact that the characters are ghosts, schemas and symbols, and thus in his ability to confer upon them the automatism of puppets. And in that automatism, the whole plastic eurythmics typical and essential of the symbol they embody for a moment." End of quote. Sternberg's approach cultivated not just a blending of actors' bodies, but also of other branches of the art. The full staging of a night included specially composed music, choreography, lighting, costumes, makeup and decor, all interacting harmoniously, and left an indelible impression on many contemporary commentators. The theatre reviewer of the Jewish newspaper um, Kurierul Israelit recounted being profoundly moved along with the rest of the audience who could not bring themselves to leave after the curtain had fallen, sitting silently together. He described a performative melding together of plastic arts, decor and gesture, in which, and I quote, music was words, words were music, dance was both words and music. A more pragmatic commentator observed that the impression of harmony, unity and rhythm <coughs> was achieved despite the limited scenic and one might add financial means available to Sternberg. 
In mid-February, the production had to be stopped due to a prior engagement of the theatre that um, Bits had been renting. And um, in the spring of 1930, Bits introduced a new production, which was adapted by Sternberg from, uh, from a short story by Shalom Alehim um, called The Bewitched Tailor. And this premiered in mid-April 1930. Although it left a lesser mark than A Night in the Old Marketplace in the contemporary press, it was uh, an equally interesting production, I think, as demonstrated by surviving images. Alehem's story, based on a folk tale, recounts the multiple journeys made by a tailor to purchase a goat from a teacher in the neighbouring village. Tricked into returning with the wrong merchandise several times, the tailor's predicament almost leads to a violent confrontation between the two settlements. Part fable, part comedy of errors, the story was adapted by Sternberg using thoroughly modern means. One commentator observed the almost cinematic series of images, the specially composed uh, soundtrack, and the introduction of two MCs or compares who announced and narrated the scenes. The production was thus more reminiscent of music hall than traditional theatre, a form of performance in which Sternberg was well versed and to which he would later return in the mid 1930s. Like in the case of A Night in the Marketplace, the decor did not change between scenes. Sternberg and the artist M. H. Maxey, who designed the play sets, opted for a simultaneous presentation of all the geographical and temporal planes of the narrative. The dwelling of the tailor and the teacher stand on opposite sides of the stage, their interiors obscured between scenes by curtains bearing the names of the rival villages. Above the sloping roofs of the two households, a medley of geometric shapes rises, jutting corners pointing in every direction. They are painted with near abstract forms, hinting at chimneys, windows, fields, clouds, and an, an enormous celestial body with a swirling polygonal shape, all tumbling vigorously across the stage. Between the two villages thus imagined, diagonal ramps construct the winding path traveled by the play's hero, here on his way to buy the goat. We can also see the two suited and bowler-hatted narrators in this corner, sheltering under an umbrella and bringing an element of the cabaret to the stage, as well as recalling the similar um, narrative and physical framing device used in A Night in the Old Marketplace. In, the, in another image, the tailor is leading the goat away as the teacher's wife clutches her earnings. Here the set shows its full potential, as our hero, his troublesome animal, its former owner and two narrators form an upward moving human construction. The left curtain is raised to reveal the teacher's home and two curious pupils who are seemingly suspended in mid-air. The modernity of the staging is evident here with ramps, ladders and sloping planes creating a multi-level performative space that recalls the theatrical techniques of constructivism. And here we see the play's most crucial moment. The teacher's wife milks the goat in front of the assembled villagers, thus proving its worth, while the tailor recoils in dismay. Like a pair of magicians, the teacher and his wife gesticulates towards the play's audience, who find themselves faced, as though in a mirror, with ascending rows of curious spectators. We can see here how the winding ramp has now been transformed into a sort of auditorium. Reviews in the contemporary press highlighted the elements that differentiated Sternberg's vision from traditional theatre, in particular the expert melding of art forms that was also evident in A Night in the Old Marketplace. In the Yiddish language Warsaw magazine, Literarische Blätter, Shlomo Beckel described the plastic <coughs> movements and flexibility of the actors, as well as praising the harmonious combination of prose, poetry and song. The Romanian newspaper Diminata noted the use of decor, light and music that set the performance aside from traditional theatrical productions, as well as the dreamlike atmosphere populated by hallucinating and hallucinated figures. As in the case of A Night, a realist approach was considered unfitting for purveying the spirit of Alehem's story. And according to the avant-garde magazine UNO, Sternberg achieved an almost cinematic synthesis through a succession of images and ideas imbued with a burlesque atmosphere. I think it's fine. It's okay. fine? Yeah. 
Opinions regarding the set were divided, however. One reviewer suggested that the insufficient dimensions of the stage were a hindrance. He thought that Maxi, the designer, was obliged to synthesize the multiple fields of vision, leaving scarce space for the, actor, for the actor's expansive and acrobatic performance. Another commentator, however, thought that this cramped aesthetic worked quite well. He said, men, women, children, and make-believe animals, as well as two villages and the road in between, a hill and an inn, have been thrown together with the most natural air on a stage no bigger than a handful of square meters. Maxi and Sterberg were no strangers to economy of means in the visual sense. And this theater stage is in fact the same one that we have seen for the more um, pareback production of A Night in the Old Marketplace. So the cramped higgledy-piggledy agglomeration in The Bewitched Tailor may have been a conscious artistic decision. Furthermore, constructing the progression of the narrative not through a succession of changing backdrops, but through the manipulation of a multifunctional set already on stage and the movements of the performance themselves interacting with its every surface was the theatrical future envisaged by many avant-garde practitioners. The montage of scenes thus created hovered somewhere between the magical and the mechanical, bodies and ramps precisely aligned, yet narrating a dreamlike fable whose temporal and geographical planes coexisted side by side. Although both productions were critically acclaimed and attracted much attention, this did not make them profitable. In May 1930, Sternberg petitioned the authorities for financial support to continue his innovative theatrical program, enclosing a balance sheet that revealed a sizable deficit. But the response was a regretful no. Despite the artistic quality of the productions, subsidies were only available for Romanian state theatres. In October 1930, while the troupe was on tour, a fire destroyed their sets, costumes and lighting equipment. Newspaper reports did not indicate any suspicious of wrongdoing, but they did paint a bleak picture for the future of the company. Sternberg was hoping to raise sufficient funds during the tour to return with further uh, innovatively designed productions. But the fire scuppered his plans and left him in a difficult financial situation. The activity of bits thus ceased after this first and only season. Although the company was short-lived and its two most elaborate productions saw the light of stage for only a few brief months in 1930, they did have a lasting impact on the Romanian artistic community. And here, for example, we have two theatre programmes, uh, one from the 1950s for The Bewitched Tailor and one from the 1970s for A Night in the Old Marketplace. And in both of them, the 1930 productions are extensively discussed. Sternberg's repertoire choices were also ambitious and uh, um, pioneering despite their limited means. And a night in the old marketplace, for example, is still considered a difficult place to stage. And this production here, which was um, premiered, I think, in 2007 in the US and it's still being performed at the moment, um, it's striking how similar it is to, to Sternberg's own adaptation and it has cabaret elements, um, it uses music that um, has influences in, from both jazz and klezmer music and obviously now there is multimedia aspect to the performance as well but I think in some ways the ideas are still aligned. And so um, I think that the fact that it's now possible to reconstruct Sternberg's efforts to a certain extent and to understand how he used design and movement to create these complex multi-layered performances um, are you know, a positive development and that they deserve a more <coughs> permanent, prominent place perhaps in the history of avant-garde theatre. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, it's uh, great to have uh, a such contribution that will take us further into the fields that we haven't dealt with so far, like music theatre and dance theatre perhaps, if I can call it like that. And also, for me personally, I have to comment, uh, it is very interesting how uh, critics can, um, uh, can, with their perceptions, offer us new avant-gardistic uh, uh, ideas. Uh, for example, I'm talking about the perceived equality of dance, music and talking, where one's sort of performance is perceived and reframed as something else something that was very much explored by the Neal Garden and that also connects us with different variants of uh, avant-garde performances. So I'm going to announce now our next um, speaker, uh, Przemek Strożek, who comes... But where's my presentation? I don't know. I, okay. Who comes okay. from this one? <laughs> who comes from the Institute of Art, Polish Academy of Sciences, 
and who will be discussing the ideas of new theater in Central and Eastern European avant-garde magazines from 1924 to 1926. Uh, where is the full screen? I cannot see. Ah, okay. Thank you very much for introduction. Uh, I decided to change a bit uh, the title of my lecture to indicate it uh, theater, international constructivism and network. Three important words for this uh, talk. And I would also like to answer to Dario's question. Uh, there is no periphery and no center when it comes to international constructivism. Okay, so I, let me uh, let me begin. During the 1920s, uh, the primary medium for activities of avant-garde groups, formations, were journals and periodicals. They served as platforms for the vanguardisms, in general directing attention to other groups, initiatives and publications. They were a gathering point, a place for sharing artistic programs and discussions, public debates and confrontations with readers, as well as sites for collective efforts. Artists associated in 1920s with international constructivism issued avant-garde magazines that reflected the idea of international progressive art that was against institutions and would be accessible to the social masses as a radical project of new modernist culture. So the model of such uh, avant-garde magazine uh, related to international constructivism was uh, this magazine issued by Elie Sitzki and uh, Ilya Ehrenburg, Vest Object Gegenstand. And what uh, Lisicki wrote uh, to Rodchenko in March 1922, we have finally realized an idea that had emerged long ago in Russia, the publication for an international magazine of modern art. It unites all those who want to foster or establish new values. And later on, unfortunately I have an error here, at the Congress of International Progressive, not countries but artists, um, uh, Lisicki uh, wrote uh, in the statement that I come here as a representative of the magazine Vesh Object Gegenstand, which stands for a new way of thinking and unites the leaders of the new art in nearly all countries. So this idea of uniting the leaders of the new art um, emerged in the international network for avant-garde magazines. So Vesh Object Gegenstand was a kind of a magazine which united new art in Western Europe, like purism or the style, or and constructivism in Russia introduced, for example, by later by Lev Circle. And what is uh, important and interesting in the recent uh, scholarship of, av of avant-garde studies is uh, the idea that um, a lot of times uh, there is a term network of journals. It, uh, it is over and over and again um, happening like this. This word is uh, um, being uh, used. For example, Tomasz also used the word network in his uh, paper. So in a book, in introduction to Between Worlds, a source, source book of uh, Central European avant-garde, Timothy Benson and Eva Forgatch write, international cooperation offered new opportunities for artists marginalized in their respective national cultures as an international network of journals, exhibitions and meeting quickly evolved. In reality, the internationalist avant-garde of the 1920s were decentralized, <laughs> nomadic, and diffuse uh, in their modes of aesthetic uh, production. Later on in the same book, uh, the both scholar, scholars underline, I quote, the avant-gardes of Central Europe are mapped as a network of cosmopolitan cities in which art movements embody the tension between the regional and the cosmopolitan. Bucharest, Budapest, Krakow, Dessa, Łódź, Prague, Poznań, Warsaw, Weimar, Zagreb, all of these had direct links to Amsterdam, Berlin, Cologne, Hanover, Moscow, Vienna or Paris. And this is well testified, for example, by Block a magazine, which shows the range of international collection, uh, connections with other avant-garde magazines, as well Ma, which had contacts to Der Sturm, The Style, Zenit, L'Esprit Nouveau and other journals. So uh, we see, clearly see that in the recent uh, scholarship on, of avant-garde studies, uh, there is a very term network applied to it. And um, 
And for example, I showed here some of the magazines which were connected to each other via the network. Uh, for example, Der Sturm from Berlin, The, Steel, the Style uh, from uh, not Amsterdam but Leiden, uh, Ma from Budapest, Host from Prague, Zenit from Zagreb, Belgrade, Contemporano from Bucharest, and so on and so on. Uh, so, also, the, it is important to underline that most of the editors of these magazines were, uh, in fact, architects. Uh, so, um, coming back to the recent scholarship, I would like to quote some uh, citations. Uh, for example, Humbert, Hubert van der Berg, uh, in A Cultural History of the Avant-Garde in Nordic Countries, writes, from a socio-historiographical point of view, the avant-garde may be profitably thought as a non-hierarchical uh, network. Uh, other scholar uh, writes that avant-garde network itself was not a hierarchical structure, but a horizontal, multifaceted and multidimensional system of connections and influences. And these ideas of avant-garde network are sometimes based on the recent uh, theories on networks, like for example, Gilles Deleuze and uh, Gattari, uh, the concept of rhizom. Uh, as well as concepts of Bruno Latour, of the actual, actual network theory, which has been uh, used, uh, for example, by uh, Malte Hagener, uh, who in the article Mushrooms and Paths and Tactics uh, used this theory to interpret the uh, network of the film, uh, filmic avant-garde. He writes in a book, uh, The Centering the Avant-Garde, in 2014, what characterizes a network is that knowledge is distributed rather than centralized. If we see the avant-garde as network, nothing is centered by itself and in every respect a periphery can just as well be central from a different angle. My suggestion would be to rather look at the flow within the network, to examine the information, materials, ideas, persons and discourses going back and forth the so-called actors, uh, as this is not only maps uh, as this not only maps the avant-garde, but it also shows more adequately the practice of exchange, production, and in uh, transformation. So, after this uh, bigger introduction, I would like to uh, make the case study on uh, magazine magazines theater network in the years of 1924 and 1926. So, between the Vienna exhibition. Uh, by, organized by Frederick Kiesler and International the Theatre Exposition in New York in 1926. In my paper, I will focus on, the, on this recent avant-garde scholarship and will discuss the flow within the network of avant-garde magazines, most profoundly with relation to avant-garde theatre and its developments between 1924 and 1926. That's why, for example, I do not include here the magazine Tank, I do not include the magazine Red uh, from uh, David Seal and others which emerged after 1926. So the period of 1924-1926 is marked here because of two very important exhibitions organized by an Austrian avant-garde artist and architect Friedrich Kiesler. International exhibition of, uh, in Vienna and the International Theatre Exhibition in New York. I claim that uh, the exhibition in Vienna was the first international theatre event that was related to international constructivism and spread big interest in theatre within avant-garde circles. This, in fact, was testified by avant-garde magazines that after 1924 issued special numbers on theatre and promoted new theatre ideas and the experimental projects related to constructivism. In my paper, I examine these projects within the networked magazines. So, how can I come to the next round? Ah, here. So, the international exhibition in Vienna has been opened in Concert House from 24, uh, September 24 to uh, 15 October and exhibited around 300 objects set and costume designs, posters and stage models from Russia, Italy, Germany, France, Czechoslovakia and Austria. And you can see the display of the exhibition, which reminded a little bit the display of uh, constructivist exhibition at Fhutemas in 1920. Uh, there was a catalogue issued uh, by uh, Friedrich Kiesler, which showed a lot of images related to international constructivist uh, stage design. 
Kistler invited to Vienna in 1924 two very important avant-garde um, artists, uh, Theo van Desbuch and Enrico Prampolini, who were at the same time the leaders, uh, the editors of the magazines, uh, van Desbuch of The Style and Enrico Prampolini of Neu, which was in fact not international constructivist magazine, but the magazine uh, related to futurism, but promoted international constructivism at their pages. So when we look at Neue magazine, edited by Prampolini, after 1924 exhibition in Vienna, he, he issued uh, the special number on theater, uh, where he um, uh, featured news on avant-garde theater from France, Russia, Germany, Holland, and Czechoslovakia, as well even a set design from Latvian artist uh, Niklas Strunke, which is here. Um, the style uh, also made some accounts on a uh, theatre exhibition in Vienna and wrote a manifesto <laughs> by uh, Friedrich Kissler, showing also together the images of his famous Raumbühne. Also, Der Sturm uh, from 1925, because Der Sturm was uh, in the 1910s more expressionist uh, journal and after uh, the First World War began be much more connected to international constructivism, also featured some uh, images of the, uh, uh, that were shown at the at Vienna ex exhibition and which were copied from the style and from here, from Neu, this image and this image of uh, Prampolini set design. Other magazine, PASMO, edited uh, by uh, Czernik from Brno, uh, which was associated with uh, David Seal, also was involved in promotion of international theater and also there were some accounts on Vienna exhibition in this magazine. For example, the photograph uh, which shows Enrico Prampolini, To van Desburg, Marinetti and Kissler himself, uh, as well as manifesto by Friedrich Kissler, Die Kulisse explodiert. Uh, other magazine, which uh, also devoted a special number to theatre that time, after, 19, after the Vienna show, was MA, uh, from, uh, edited uh, by Lajos Kaszak in Vienna and Budapest. And uh, the number eight uh, also featured news on avant-garde theatre from Italy, Russia, France and Hungary. And also we see that this ledger and images <laughs> are copied and shared from um, the other magazines. This also is a uh, thing related to the magazine Host from Prague, edited by Karel Taige, uh, which uh, featured, for example, the stage design of Vesnin, and the stage design which was very often shared and reprodu reproduced within the network of the, of the magazines. Uh, also, um, the uh, Bucharest magazine, Contemporanul, um, which was edited by uh, Marcel Janko, in 1925 issued a special number on theatre and cinema, which included uh, the uh, projects by Marcel Janko and, for example, by Alexander Vesny. The same can be said when we think about uh, Integral magazine from B Bucharest, uh, edited by Max uh, Hermann Maxi, which also published uh, a lot of images. Uh, these images, this one, this one, this one, this one, and that one, were copied directly from the Vienna catalog from 1924. So we can see that within this network <laughs> of avant-garde magazines, some of the images are uh, being repeated Yes, like for example the Vesnin uh, image uh, of this uh, stage design which has been published in Host, Contemporanul, Ma and also Stavba magazine in Prague. The same can be said for example when we think about the stage design of Friedrich Kiesler, the RUR uh, stage design, uh, this has been uh, uh, published for example, in Vienna Catalog, in Neu uh, by Enrico Prampolini, as well as in Integral. Um, and also some important texts around uh, the new theatre. I think 
This one is very interesting uh, by Erwin Hirschel Proch, which is like an unknown figure, I think still, <laughs> uh, who was associated with a group Junge Schlesien uh, from Wrocław. And uh, he published a text, uh, the uh, drama of the movement in Polish, in Block magazine, as well as Das, Be das Bewegungsdrama in Ma magazine. So also this flow of uh, information were not only images, but also the manifestos and text which were uh, translated. And this is, for example, the image in Pasmo in from Brno and Ma from Vienna. Uh, in 1925, we can see like the increased interest uh, in uh, avant-garde magazines, which also issued special numbers to theater. Uh, this is a magazine block uh, from Warsaw, and uh, which did not really uh, publish the accounts uh, on Vienna show, and Pol Polish artists also didn't participate in this exhibition. Uh, these projects actually were prepared for the 1925 uh, Paris exhibition, um, for the World Exhibition and the Theatre section, but uh, due to the reasons that Mieczysław Szczuka boycotted the event, they have been sent to New York in 1926. So we can see that um, this is the catalogue uh, of the international exposition in New York, which was in <coughs> fact a magazine which is, I think, also important uh, in this fact, uh, and also has been issued in the United States, because like in the United States, uh, this exhibition <laughs> took place. And in the New York exhibition of 1926, the participated countries were Austria, Belgium, Czechoslovakia, France, Germany, Holland, Hungary, Italy, Yugoslavia, Latvia, Poland, Russia, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, United States, and England. So we can see that from the s very small <laughs> Vienna exposition which featured only 300 objects. Uh, this exhibition in New York featured 1,500 uh, objects. And also such countries like Poland, uh, Latvia, Yugoslavia participated for the first time, most probably also thanks to the dis dissemination of, of uh, images and uh, theater manifestos in the networked uh, magazines. So I would like to conclude uh, now and uh, I need to write, I would like to read. We can clearly observe that the international promotion of avant-garde theater began for the first time on such a scale after the show in Vienna in 1924 and was largely promoted within the flow of the networked magazines. We cannot forget that the main propagator was here Friedrich Kiesler, who was the organizer of both exhibitions in Vienna and in New York and had direct contacts with avant-garde magazines such as The Style from Netherlands, Pasmo from Brno and Ma from Vienna as well as Neu from Rome. The Vienna exhibition of 1924 spanned the interest on theatre within avant-garde circles, especially in Central and Eastern Europe, which, apart Czechoslovakia, did not participate in Vienna. The copied and shared images of stage designs, as well as text on theatre, were all against traditionalism, conservatism and the idea of national theatre. All the theatre special numbers of avant-garde magazines focused much more on the images of stage design than on the images of actors or the content of dramas they illustrated. Uh, they also promoted the same images of the international style in stage design, uh, which promoted spatial constructions rather than painted the core. In this context, I think it would be better to name these experiments as theater of architects, brought by international constructivism, rather than a vague term theater of painters. All the magazines I was discussing here leaned from painting to our architecture. They made a radical change from composition to construction, from forming to building. Uh, for example, uh, Block was edited by architect Mieczysław Szczuka, uh, host by Karel Tiger, who was also architect, the Van Desburg also from the style. So they all <laughs> were architects and uh, they focused much more on stage constructions rather than on actor and play itself. So here I would like to a little bit uh, discuss it with, with Hanna. Um, okay, so I would like to conclude. All the, uh, 
There were merely architects who wanted to modernize theater according to principles of international constructivism. The visual material within the avant-garde network magazines testifies to this and opens new horizons of avant-garde studies within the field of theater. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank our colleague for opening another uh, field for us to discuss, uh, uh, the field of avant-garde theater magazines and also uh, the influence of the um, education and reasoning of architects on the editorial policies of such magazines. And uh, I would like to announce our next uh, speaker, uh, Ketevan Kinturashvili, from, uh, uh, as an independent scholar who comes from Georgia, uh, with the following paper, Mainstrom, the early 20th century Georgian scenography and how texts give birth to the new forms in art. A few years ago, with the uh, support of Goethe Institute in Georgia, I curated an exhibition entitled Maestro, Franz Marc, German Expressionism and Modernism in Georgia. Uh, we staged it at the Shevardnadzeg Georgian National Gallery in Tbilisi. The exhibition was conceived uh, according to the subtitle as a multidisciplinary research within the exhibition environment. Today, I want to present um, this, uh, this uh, show as, as well as the book, two books. Uh, one of them, the smaller one, was published after the exhibition was closed in 2015. And the other one uh, was republished this year uh, by the Polish scientific uh, publication. I would, would like to talk about the idea of this show and the works which were presented at the exhibition. Something. It doesn't work. It's just like, let's come back and now. I think it should work. So, in June 2015, a yellow banner with a tiger on it, hanging down the facade of the National Gallery in the center of Tbilisi, aggressively broke into the space of the city. The exhibition's logo was based upon a canvas created by Franz Marc in 1913 and now kept in Lemba House in Munich. The exhibition was inspired by a small book published in Tbilisi in 1926. It contains three dramas by the Georgian symbolist expressionist writer Grigol Robakidze and includes Londa, Maelstrom and Vlamara. The cover of the book was designed according to Franz Marx's Tiger, which is why it became the protagonist of the exhibition. The flower opens uh, at sunrise. Seeing his prey, the panther crouches, and as a result of seeing it, his strength grows, and the tension of his strength shows in the length of his leaf. The form of art, its style, is the result of tension. The exhibition used these words, which belong to the artist August Macke, as an epigraph. They emphasize the fact that at the initial stage of modernism, nature was the source of inspiration for artists, men, plants, and animals. Their observation of the environment is inspired them, and they were driven by the desire to delve deeply into this world. To illustrate the above, Vasily Kantinsky's 1901 landscape was presented at the exhibition although at that time expressions had not yet become a trend. In this picture, the forefather of abstraction only draws nearer to the idea of escaping from the expression of visible reality. Of course, the decision to include Kandinsky in the exhibition was also based upon his close friendship with Franz Marc. In 1911, Kandinsky and Marc jointly founded the artistic association The Blue Writer. Generally, as uh, 
uh, wilderness incarnate, the tiger has a symbolic charge in Robakidze's creative work. His well-known poem, In Tiger's Months, was included in the body of the exhibition logo. Indeed, Robakidze himself was often compared to a tiger. As the poet Tizian Tabidze once wrote about him, Robakidze roared like a wounded tiger when he spoke in public about Friedrich Nietzsche and Edgar Poe. Thus, the exhibition outlined the significance of an animal in the development of expressionism. Impressive in Robakidze is the clatter of hoofs of blue horses or the leap of the tiger and, <coughs> and its paw and so on. His expressions frequently found in his, uh, such expressions frequently found in his works are the careers of an animal energy. At the beginning of the 20th century, Grigol Robakidze studied in Germany. He had already returned to Georgia when Mark painted his tiger but his relationship with the German cultural world continued. He might have chosen this image for the book's design himself, but unfortunately we don't know who is the author of the design of that book. Robakidze's above mentioned three dramas were performed at the Rustavelli Drama Theater in Tbilisi the moment they were written in 1922, 1925. The productions were designed by the artists Irakli, Gamrekeli, Kirill, Zdanevich, and Lado Gutiashvili, whose sketches of those productions were at the heart of the show. The performances were staged by the reformers of Georgian theater, the directors Kote Marjanishvili and Sandro Ahmeteli, who in the 1920s were credited with founding a theater based upon the principle of ensemble, one of whose major components was scenography. Kote Marjanishvili invited Georgian artists with avant-garde mindsets to work at the theater. In 1922, he saw Gamrekeli's illustrations of Oscar Wilde's Salome at the exhibition and invited the artists to the theater in order to express this uh, sa uh, same drama on stage. The sketches created for that performance were on display at the exhibition for the first time ever and are in fact the first samples of Georgian theater design. In the 1920s, Marjanishvili set himself the goal of creating an expressionist theater in Georgia, a modernistic task in which he was helped by Robakidze's dramaturgy. In 1924, Robakidze published an article in Georgian on Expressionism. In it, he wrote that there was naturalism which strove to represent a subject, impressionism which set out to represent an impression, and expressionism an exponent of the ecstasy of a human soul. A yellow theme was prevalent throughout the exhibition's design and advertising. This expressionistic color is often represented in Robakidze's work as the, color, as the color of the sun, of tigers, and gold. In his notes for Londa, the author indicates the principal color, much yellow, and yellow is indeed the leading color in Irakli Gamrekeli's abstract expressionistic decorations for Londa. The choice of Maelstrom as the exhibition's name was clear, as Robakidze's eponymous second play was realized by, by Marjanishvili and Ahmeteli jointly with Irakli Gamrekeli and Kirill Zdanevich. The Maelstrom is a strong current near the Lofoten Islands off the coast of Norway. This old Scandinavian wo word consists of two roots, milling and current. This whirlpool, like a mill, draws in everything in its path and destroys it. Robakidze's use of the word as the title of this play was perhaps inspired by Edgar Poe's famous story, A Descent into the Maelstrom. It cannot be ruled out that he was primarily attracted by the word sound. In any case, Robakidze's work often features a river into which men or women, women usually descend. But in this case, the title Maelstrom acquires an even broader meaning. This play by Robakidze is about the tension between the modernized and ou uh, outside words. Walls, a city and a village, a car and a nature, and nature, the rich and the poor, 
evil and good, unbeliever and believer oppose each other in it. Robakitsev writes with irony about the clients of the city cafes, casi casinos, and brothels. In the city, he describes where even Dada Square exists, monkeys rise in rebellion in the zoo while nature is alive in the country. There, a river keeps its secret in the country and grass has a peculiar fragrance. Modernization is a symbol of what is opposed to nature and destroys it. it uh, destroys it. In this world, full of telephones, electric light, and cars, earthquakes quakes frequently happen. Soon they will drain even a river. The river girl will then disappear too. Soon they will also cut down forests. The forest queen will then disappear. Rice Robakitze. Thus, for him, as a metaphor, maelstrom means being swept away by modernization, mechanization, mechanization industri industrialization, and urbanization. The emotional experience of nature <coughs> is especially noteworthy in Grigol Robakitsy's play La Mara, written in 1925 at Marjanishvili's request and uh, whose staging required the creation of natural, natural scenery and quasi-ethnographic costumes. Marjanishvili commissioned Lado Budiashvili in whose creative work the existence of expressionistic features did not, not imply a full abstraction of forms. Beno Gordesiani's portrait of the poet Valjab Shavela, along with his work Tzhratzharo, Nine Streams, are important works of Georgian modernism of that time, too. Uh, during the early 1920s, a series of plays by German and Austrian uh, expressionist dramatists such as Ernst Toller, Georg Kaiser, and Franz Werfel were also staged at the Rustaveli Theatre. Men, the, uh, men and Masses, Gas, and Mirror Men. In these plays, the problems are mechanization and urbanization, the interrelation of men and society, a person and the masses, their opposition, spirituality, freedom, faith, establishing oneself in the modernized world, injustice, loss of values, and so on. The tension of the emotions in this place echoes the hardest times before and after the World War I in Europe, and although, over a uh, and although over a century has passed since then, they have not lost their relevance. The Georgian fut uh, futuristic magazine H2SO4 <coughs> was founded by Gordesiani and Gambrer Kelly, and, was pa and this is the work which was uh, the piece which was made by uh, Gambrer Kelly for this magazine. Uh, H2SO4. Uh, uh, it was published by the Georgian Futuristic Union in 1924. Both Gamrekeli and Gordesiani were active members of this union, whose magazine is the most vivid example of Georgian uh, futuristic, dadaistic graphic design of that time. One of the exhibition's main purposes was to reveal uh, uh, the mutual influence of theater design and cinema design in the art of the modernist era. In Marjanishvili and Gamrekeli's production of Hamlet at the Rustaveli Theater in 1925, we can see, as in the sketches of other productions as well, abstract mystical decorations common to 1920s cinema art, specifically with German expressionistic cinematography. In 1928, Marjanishvili staged Ernst Toller's Hopla, uh, We Are Alive, at the Kutais Batumi Theater. He had found it, today's Marjanishvili Theater in Tbilisi. The production design was entrusted to David Kakabaze, who had just returned to Georgia from Paris, and who transferred to the stage the artistic achievements he had arrived in, at his, uh, in his own collages while he was in Paris. During the performance, the walls of the construction could be transformed into uh, film screens. 
specially shot film episodes using the same actors who played in the performance were projected onto them. The late 1920s also witnessed the creation of masterpieces of Georgian avant-garde cinema, notably the film Saba, designed by Kakabadze and Gutierrezvili. The influence of cinema is noteworthy in Elena Afledianis' works for the production How by Galadze. Besides the fact that a tape was also included in this production, the scenes in general, especially with regard to the use of light and shade, found features common with cinematographic animation shots. In 1927, Marjan invited the 20-year-old artist Petre Otscheli to the theater as a set and costume designer, who later dedicated his entire career to scenography. Otscheli's work organically combines elements of several modernistic trends, including Art Nouveau, Expressionism, and Art Deco. In 1929, Ahmeteli staged La Mara anew with designs by Irakli Gamrekeli. In 1931, Robakizer left for Germany, and this time the writer would be denied the opportunity to return. In Stalin's state, he was labeled a formalist, and his name was removed from Lamara's posters. Because of the play's similarity to Vajab Shavela's poem, The Snake Eater, its author's name was replaced by According to Vajab Shavela, and this despite the fact that Robakizer had included um, Rajab Shavela is a character in this play. In the uh, works presented at the exhibition, the e experiences of various trends, various branches of art, and various styles harmonized with each other and were united uh, by an avant garde vision, the characteristics of the modernist era. In Robakitze's words, nature is like a domesticated wild beast. If you enrage it, it will show you its furry, furious claws. He, he writes, we do not want to earth, we want a car. A man, a car, a brain, a car, will, a car, a car. The first word uh, of civilization, and I guess the last one, writes he in Maelstrom. And yet, the era of the car and modernization uh, as a whole created artistic trends and forms which continue to inspire us up to this day, day. The artifacts presented at the exhibition are genuine examples of this modernist trend. They show us how powerful the influences of such ideas were, ideas such as Cubism, Futurism, Kubo-Futurism, Luchism, Dadaism, Constructivism, and German Expressionism, and how they were proceeded on Georgian soil. This creative body of work could be compared to a way which, in the form of modernism, washed over the civilized Western world. The works presented at the exhibition corroborate the fact that modernism left a strong trace in Georgian culture and art that could not be erased, not even uh, by the fierce attacks against the, uh, it launched by the totalitarian Soviet regime. The exhibition showed how global the content of a single exhibition space can be at present. Maelstrom connected eras, distant countries, cultures, people, branches, and sub-branches within. With minimalist decorations, uh, reds and blues along with dominant yellows, special lighting, and uh, a video installation, Mount River, by, Gio, by the visual artist and uh, composer Gio Janiashvili. The exhibition's designer, David Janiashvili, turned the exhibition as a whole into an installation, which was perceived as a replica of the um, avant-garde art, art and literary work of the 1910s and 20s. Uh, along with other issues, uh, the exhibition underlined the role of drama in the development of the art of scenography and proved to us once again that it is only in connection with the dramatic works and their texts that we can comprehensively investigate the scenographer's contribution to a performance. 
This is very important for understanding the meaning of the 1910s, 1920s scenography for today's scenographers and visual artists. It is the modernist scenograph uh, the ability of the scenographers of nine, uh, the early modernism to visualize a text, <coughs> content, sound, and rhythm in space that is of utmost importance. The more so that all trends and movements in the art of postmodern era, installation, performance, conceptualist, minimalist, feminist art, etc., are based on some kind of concept, dramaturgy. And these days, the idea, the concept, still plays a very important role almost in any branch of art. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, perhaps providing us also with another connecting thread between all these presentations, uh, and that is stage design. Uh, so now we will be open for discussion, and I would like to call uh, uh, two other presenters uh, to join us uh, here. We have at least 15 minutes, but perhaps more if the discussion lasts longer. So if anybody would like to ask a question, that would be nice. So, if I may, because uh, all the three presentations somehow um, ask the question that we are facing all the time during our, our meetings, as you, as you remember. Because at the very beginning, we started with uh, the anthology of uh, uh, national avant-garde. Yeah? It was done like that because it should be done like that for, let's say, outer reasons. But uh, and in, even in this very phase, uh, first phase of the project, we have this feeling that it's it's, it's something against the spirit of the avant-garde, yeah? to reconstruct the national uh, avant-garde. So I think we need to overcome this idea. Uh, and I like this, um, both metaphors you, you, you proposed, the metaphor of, uh, of network, uh, uh, but I like much the metaphor of the stream, uh, of maelstrom. Uh, so, uh, but the question is, because I still think that the question of periphery and center somehow is uh, relevant to our, to our project, because all our countries are uh, regarded as periphery of Europe. So we are somehow being, uh, the avant-garde being in a network, and of course being decentralized as it was, uh, acted in a world that is divided to periphery and and center. So the question is, and I don't, don't think it's a question for, for you only, but it's a question for all of us, how to organize our project in this context. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. all the time we are in a danger of playing with uh, some kind of uh, uh, you know, weakness or complexes and so on and so on. Uh, and the question is how to avoid it and at the same time uh, play with this, this uh, real, real context. Yeah, I, I would like to refer to what you, what you said, because um, when we think about avant-garde and network within avant-garde, I think only international constructivism <laughs> destroyed the idea of central, mm -hmm. centrum and periphery. When we think about surrealism, the center was Paris, of yeah. course. Yeah. When we think about futurism, the center was Italy. When we think about Cubism, the center was, of course, Paris as well. But the idea of network and decentralizing, <laughs> uh, the decentralization, like, it is very much connected to the idea of international constructivism and uh, to the idea of the third international as well. Because all this, 
artists I presented here and projects were made by artists who were involved in uh, leftist ideology, except, of course, Enrico Prampolini, who was Italian futurist, and in 1930s he leaned much more toward fascism. But at the end, um, this was idea of the internationality and the third international and how to create a new world through the utopia of constructivism, of construction, the new world. This was the idea I wanted to show here. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I framed this <laughs> my talk only within the international constructivist movement and I didn't talk about other years. <laughs> because I think 1924, 1926 is the strongest influence of constructivism in, in Europe. I think even more progressive than what was happening in Paris or in Italy. Yeah. So I think that's why I wanted to make here this... Uh, um, yeah. We have another question. Yeah. It's a comment, and then it will become a question, or it will become uh, signified in the, in, in a sense. Uh, I, I, like, I think it's very important what you what you what you started to uh, to what, what the, the, the thoughts you started today. Basically, how to deal with the with the avant garde because in themselves the avant garde especially for for example, I think the constructivism, they are nomadic. Yeah, and this right. the, the, the term of nomadic, it's, it's very good. It, it's also, we could refer back to the, the old uh, term now of raison, of Deleuze Gatterie, yeah. which is good because you don't know where this raison would go. So suddenly we get constructivism in Russia, and then ups, we get it in Georgia, we get it in, in Slovenia, we get it, we can get it everywhere. So this is something which is, I think, very important. But we cannot think uh, uh, the, the avant garde outside of the, of the world of politics. This is, yeah, of this is impossible. But we know also that we cannot think about the Italian futurism as somebody which is and was always linked to the fascism because there was also the, mm -hmm. the leftist uh, futurism. Yeah. And so, so I think this is very interesting. And the idea of the stream, yeah, I like the idea of the stream also. It's, I think it's very good because it's, it has something powerful in itself. And it's also, you cannot predict it in, in a way. Uh, so thi this is this is uh, this I find very uh, good, but the question which we 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 still facing even after after how many years there is after the fall of the Berlin uh, Berlin Wall is the the decolonization of the gaze uh, on on the avant garde the the map the east. Uh, uh, a map of the avant-garde is still not existing because mm -hmm. it has to do with something which is connected to to the, the way which we used to, to the orientalism which we're all living in. So I think this is it's it's very th th this is why the project you started. I think it's very important not not just for these peripheral <laughs> states but also for for uh, for London, uh, Paris, and uh, and the other yes, okay. the other the other cities. Yeah. And for looking for the point of view from which we would approach yeah, this, so obviously, yeah. obviously, it cannot. I, I, what, from what I'm, I'm sorry, I interrupted you, but it seems yes, Zoltan okay. has another. I just want to comment that it seems that uh, we started from an idea of how we would like to approach something, and then as we went through the material, we realized mm -hmm. that perhaps it's not a valid point of view, and but again perhaps not for all the field. For s perhaps there should be more different approaches with which to um, um, deal, I mean, that we should apply to, to uh, such a diverse material. Uh, Zoltan, uh, yes, a question. Yes, uh, uh, I have a question or a, or a comment to Premislav's uh, speech. Uh, it's a question. Uh, it's a question international and intercultural at the same time and I agree with you that there was a network with various nodes that there was no single center so we have to go beyond this uh, center periphery mo model but I have a strong doubt that the avant-garde was marginal in each of the Eastern European countries and uh, last year when I came to this uh, to the conference in, in Warsaw I was 
I had this idea that the uh, uh, avant-garde was marginal because the Hungarian avant-garde was of course marginal. Mm -hmm. yeah, but I had to realize that there were some other Eastern European countries where uh, the avant-garde was the mainstream. Mm -hmm. So uh, <laughs> the question, of my question would be that how can we, and it's a, it's a general question, and it goes back to, uh, to Derek's uh, point, that how can we revise the language and the expressions we used to speak about the avant-garde? Uh, if I would make to comment uh, the point, I think um, <coughs> the magazines were kind of a platform also for artists uh, who are mar marginalized in their countries. Like for example, the leftist uh, artists were not so much, um, couldn't not much exhibit uh, in Warsaw or in Budapest uh, during that time. So magazines were also a platform to promote their artworks outside of exhibition, which was uh, <coughs> also very, means, yeah. uh, very, very important. Um, yeah. And uh, that's why I think this is so important to study the magazines right now, uh, which is like, <laughs> uh, which shows this also political, uh, mm, how can I say it? Uh, ideas also behind, behind the magazines. And uh, for example, in Poland, uh, yeah, like the block uh, um, group has been, of course, marginalized. Uh, I mean, like, it hasn't been <coughs> so obvious as, for example, in Czech Czech Czechoslovakia at the time. That, for example, the David Seal movement was one of the, I think, the strongest in the country at uh, that time. So <laughs> I think this is also very interesting to, to look at it uh, from the national perspective, but also within international uh, uh, frame. So it's like, <laughs> but thank you, thank you very much for the, for the um, remark. Uh, another question, uh, and then another, another one. Maybe not question, but like some notes. Uh, I'm from Belarus, uh, and this time here, so nice to meet you. And uh, I have like two ideas. One is about this Navadi concept, because it, it's mm -hmm. really, uh, uh, great, I think, but it works good for like obvious and big culture, let's say, for example, because if we speak about Belarus, you know, mm -hmm. maybe Unovis Vitex school, yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, all people uh, know know it as a Russia Avanga. It was mm -hmm. established in Vitex mm -hmm. and happened in Vitex, <laughs> but um, so I can guess why. Yeah, but, but nomadic concept it doesn't work here. And it's a question about something more than just. Uh, and the second note about Przemyslav uh, uh, talked about theater of architecture versus the theater Architects. of Architects. Architects, yeah. And uh, interesting fa fact, for, for example, from Belarusian theater history, because 20, uh, uh, 1920s years, uh, the scholars uh, describe as like, uh, uh, three direction of theatre at that time, and one is uh, realistic theatre based on Stanislavski system, the second one uh, revolutionary theatre by Meyer Holt, and the third one like synthetic theatre. And interesting note that uh, scholars uh, wrote that uh, it was a time when avant-garde became a mainstream, and this theatre of architects became a mainstream, and that's why some director uh, uh, used uh, like really specially this artificial paint background against this mainstream theater of architects. <laughs> so it, it's like a different concept, <coughs> context and uh, historical circumstances. I think it's also, uh, we, sh we should know. Yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, Martinez? Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you for uh, all the presentations, which were fascinating. And just to remind you to connect them to the very first presentation of Thomas, I happen to notice that uh, uh, in one of your quotes that you were using, there was this notion of barbarians. 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 The two barbarians. You see, the thing is that I've reacted to this quote because uh, coming from Lithuania, we're coming from Lithuania. The, uh, uh, the notion of barbariousness bar is deeply rooted in our culture because mm -hmm. uh, Lithuania is probably the last to adapt to Christianism in Europe. 
from every day. <laughs> And it's, it's a bit of a, a part of the national identity. Mm -hmm. But coming back to the ideas of the avant-garde, uh, it sort of <coughs> seems that this at least partial identification with barbarians is also a uh, uh, source for the strength of uh, renovation of the ideas, aren't they? Especially in case of Lithuania, that's especially evident in the 30s where the avant-garde was uh, avant-gardist ideas and avant-gardist means of expression were intertwined with their neo-folkist or folkish kind of forms that may create the major trend in the 30s Europe and in the 20th <laughs> in particular. So I guess this idea of um, center and periphery it cannot be totally excluded. Yeah. It cannot uh, disappear from the picture because it was somewhat here. Geographically, ideal or mentally. Um, any more questions? More like a comment, if I may? Of course, yes. Uh, to, to Alexander's presentation, because don't you think that there's uh, uh, like a paradigmatic example? Uh, of his no nomadic uh, Jewish theaters uh, mm. performing mm. parrots in the uh, in the villa than than in in the Bucharest, and all the time it's like uh, an, a radical avant-gardist uh, performance. Uh, somehow uh, escaping our uh, our uh, our view, because for long times the uh, historians were focused on national mm -hmm. theaters, and then uh, the Yiddish theater is vanished. Yes. Because you cannot say, for example, that it, it's problematic even for, for, for Jewish uh, historians if I would say that Yiddish theatre is a Polish theatre. No, it, it's, and, and then it started to be very, very hard to, to, to comment upon. Because when I was writing, a, when I was writing a, a history of Polish theatre, it was a very strong and a very problematic question. Mm. Uh, what should I do with a Jewish theatre in Poland when I was writing about Polish theatre? Mm. <laughs> what to do? And I think that when we are start to, to, to talk about the streams and networks and so on, mm -hmm. then the question of the Jewish theater is in the center of this problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, a, a Jewish avant-garde is like uh, yeah, isomatic, uh, nomadic, uh, <laughs> not working, <laughs> and so on. Yes, I, guess I had this problem at the beginning because what I started out doing is to have a survey of Romanian avant-garde theater, which has not really been done so far. And then when I started my research, I realized that non nobody was really an ethnic Romanian, if I can say that. I don't know <laughs> what to call them. But yeah. <laughs> so, so the most innovative project was the Vilna Troupe, which was obviously formed in Vilnius uh, before the First World War. But then they didn't stay there for very long. They went to Warsaw, then they came to Bucharest, then they scattered all over the place. And some of them ended up in, in America. Um, so for example, there was one performance that I found that was um, Produced in Bucharest and then it actually traveled to Chicago. So they are very, you know, sort of not really the obvious places that you might expect that are connected in these networks, like you're saying. Um, but yeah, about the center periphery problem, I was hoping that we only have that in art history because that's my background. <laughs> 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 and so my idea was that by introducing these sort of more performative elements, that we could see how the avant-garde were actually much more interconnected and much more mm -hmm. nomadic than looking at, for example, just painting would suggest. So yes, I was hoping that you are you are, you have the solution, but obviously that's not the case. So we'll find it. Find some. <laughs> yeah, I, I have also a question. Like, did Marcel Janko, because he was a Jewish, mm -hmm. he did also participate in in the Jewish theater, the Romanian um, Jewish Yiddish theater? Or he not? not so much in that one. There were other um, more local initiatives. So he participated a bit in those, uh, but I found it very difficult to find images actually of his sets. I have a few, but not very many. Mm -hmm. But Maxi, who was the editor of Integral that you also showed, he was the designer of one of the productions that I was talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he worked a lot with the Vilna troupe actually in the mid 1920s. Um, but again, these identities are very difficult to negotiate because Yanku was a lot more Jewish, if I can call him that, like he actually talked, you know, he wrote about his identity and then he, he um, emigrated to Israel, whereas Maxi never really wrote about himself as a Jewish artist and he remained in Bucharest. So it's not so easy to, you know, kind of, I don't want to put people in, in boxes really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, if we, ha we have another question. Very 
briefly. Um, I was just want, wondering how much attention was being paid to the Yiddish theatres mm. by people of majority ethnicities in various mm. countries. I mean, it, I don't, I'm not in, in any way an expert on the Yiddish theatre, but it strikes me that it was probably strongest, at least in terms of modernist developments in Lithuania, Poland and Romania. And they're three of the most anti-Semitic countries <laughs> in Europe, which is also, a, it does have to be said, I think. Yeah, I, I mean, when I was looking at the, the Vilna tree, for example, so in 1924, 1925, they had a production that became like very, very famous. Um, and they had, um, it went on for months and months and the royal family attended. And you know everybody who was anybody in the Bucharest intelligentsia was attending because I think it became fashionable in a way. So there was this moment when everybody thought this is the in thing, this is the hip thing to go and see. So they went to see it. And there are many comments in the press about how even though they didn't understand <laughs> the language, that it didn't matter because they could understand the performance anyway because it was so expressive. So there were a couple of moments when it became mainstream, but you know that was not by any means the majority of the time. Uh, another question, Martin. Yes. Uh, follow up on the Yiddish reception in Lithuania. It's not my specialty, as a matter of fact, but since this book came out in Lithuania about the Jewish theatre, so I could expand a little bit on that. Uh, in fact, it appeared that there was a, a major collaboration between Jewish uh, Jewish companies, high amateur Jewish companies, and Lithuania and a major Lithuanian theatre directors. They were making projects all together. Uh, the place where they would show them was called the Summer Theater in Konas, which was the capital of Lithuania at that time. Uh, and judging by the statistics, attendance to the Summer Theater, which operated seasonally, but it's statistically, sometimes it even surpassed in terms of frequency than the state and major stage in Konas. So it was uh, really popular. In fact, those productions were in between genres, so they were sort of damned for their popularity. So they were, uh, they were quite attended. Although I have to add that the, the population of Comas in the 20s and the 30s was uh, rather mixed. I mean, uh, one, roughly one third of the population was Jewish at that time. So that also has to be included into the picture, but it was not marginal at all. Uh, if we are finished, I would like to thank everybody who participated in uh, sessions these mornings and uh, perhaps comment that we have reached two important questions. One is the question of affiliation, who does uh, the Amagard belong to, where does it come from? And in relation to that, the question of its centrality, whether we should consider it in that case as central or peripheral. And I only can hope that future sessions will bring us more questions and perhaps some answers. So thank you very much.